here we are on the road, the rusty, dusty trail. I don't know if I'm gonna like it. I might DNF. We're traveling about, going to and fro, here and there and everywhere. Jerking off a statue is one of them. Well, hello. Welcome back to my channel. Just Shauna here to talk about some friggin' books. I am helter skelter today. This has already been just a time getting set up and I'm a little sniffly, so I've got these nearby. I'm also very tired, but I have a somewhat busy day ahead of me. And it's early in the morning. Well, it's not that early. I've been awake for a couple hours, but I need to get some videos done. So here we are. So bear with me if I seem foggy brained. I need to talk about quite a few books today. This might actually be broken up into two videos. We'll see how long I talk <laughs> about them. And so far in January, I have completed six books. A couple of them I did start in December. <laughs> so there's that. And then I have only DNF'd one so far. Looking good so far this year. This first book, I don't believe I talked about. I don't think I did. When I did my end of year like stats, I included this book, but I hadn't included it in like a recent reviews, few reviews, recent wrap up, whatever the fuck these videos are. I don't believe I had included it. So first one I actually completed in the end of 2023, An Education in Malice by S.T. Gibson. This one is upcoming release. It's due to come out February 13th. I did get a NetGalley e-arc of this in exchange for an honest review. I also recently had a physical arc of Evocation by S.T. Gibson. That one is due to come out in March, I believe, or May. May. May 28th is when it is currently expected to be released. And both of them are categorized as dark academia fantasy. And I did enjoy Evocation. I really liked the characters. Like I said, the plot of that one was kind of like, eh, whatever. Um, but I did really enjoy the character dynamics. But I liked An Education in Malice a fair bit more. Um, this one is, again, dark academia. And this one, I think, is more dark academia. I said with Evocation, it's categorizes that and kind of getting marketed as that but it there wasn't a lot of like the academia stuff going on for me the characters are adults and I I can't even remember I think one of them is a professor maybe and they're definitely in the like occult secret society like academia thing but none of them are like university students or anything like that and I think that's when dark academia just like it doesn't quite do it for me an Education in Malice is definitely more dark academia. Our main characters are younger. They are in at university. Uh, one of them is a freshman and the other one is a junior, if memory serves me. We have Laura, who is the freshman, and she is from a very, like, sheltered, innocent, pure upbringing. And it's taking place in the 60s. And, yeah, Laura is just, a, like, a preacher's daughter and all about like her religion. She does from the very get go explain and, and mention and you see it. She questions religion a lot. Like she wants to learn more about it. And she does want to be a preacher herself uh, because women are being allowed in the clergy and she's excited for that. But she's definitely like a little more progressive in her views on things and like enjoys questioning and like researching and kind of analyzing her her faith, right? And then we have Carmilla. And that is where I've seen people question why this is a Dowry of Blood number two. And it's in the same world as Dowry of Blood. So vampires, for sure, we see right away. And this one is clearly, with a main character named Carmilla, it is a Carmilla reimagining, you know, a modern take on Carmilla. And whereas A Dowry of Blood was kind of like a Dracula-ish story, but it was from the perspective of one of his brides, right? And after she had killed him. That's not a spoiler. It's like in the synopsis, it's the beginning of the book. Uh, but yeah, so this one is just, it's in the same world. And I was kind of like, as I was reading it, I was just like, okay, I think this is just kind of in the same world. And obviously it's a Carmilla reimagining. So maybe this series is just kind of books in this general, stories in this general world, that are reimaginings of these classic like gothic tales. I was thinking like maybe there's gonna be like a Frankenstein one or something, I don't know. But also there are some uh, 
crossover characters. They're not prominent characters in this one, uh, but we do see a character, at least, a character that we saw in Dowry of Blood. And when I saw that character, I was like, oh my God, ah, I'm so excited. Um, they're not in it a lot, like I said, and they come in like, I think it was well over halfway. But yeah, anyways, all that to say, I did enjoy this. I was surprised because I was kind of expecting to like this one less than Evocation just because it is so dark academia and I could tell from the synopsis going into it. Like we're gonna be with characters that are like at university doing this stuff. Uh, but yeah, rereadability. Uh, I will definitely be purchasing a copy of this to reread it in the future, largely because of the characters. I loved these characters. Like I said, I'm learning that this is what I enjoy the most that S.T. Gibson does, on top of just the, the authorial voice, the use of language. She just, like, writes things so beautifully, basically. Laura and Carmilla both felt like very real people to me. And I personally found they're like, it's not like enemies to lovers because I, I think people throw that around a lot when it's more just like, I didn't like you when I first met you or I got a bad first impression of you and I don't, you're distasteful to me. And people call that like enemies to lovers. I don't think that's really enemies. This I feel like was rivals. Sorry, hold on. My eye on top of the snifflies. My eye has been watering all fucking morning. Anyway, the rivals to lovers dynamic for me was like top tier. I thought it was done so well. They were just battling it out. They were in competition for this one professor's attentions. Uh, Mrs. D, I can't remember her full name. Carmilla always just calls her Mrs. D. But yeah, she's this professor there um, teaching about poetry and they just get enthralled with her. And pretty quickly, I don't think this is a spoiler. I, it's like very, very early on in the book. Um, Mrs. D is a vampire and Carmilla is aware of this. No one else is. So it just, it was all very compelling. There, Carmilla and Mrs. D's dynamic, Carmilla and Laura, Laura and Mrs. D, like all, their, all of their dynamics separately. And then the dynamic of the three of them was very, very interesting and compelling. Obviously, you know, I guess content warning for like an age gap and more so than an age gap, because I mean, she's a vampire. There's like always an age gap <laughs> in like vampire story with vampires and humans. Um, but, and, and it's not really like a sexual thing, but it's an inappropriate relationship with like a power dynamic thing, like between professor and student, um, again, it's not necessarily sexual, but it's inappropriate <laughs> for sure. And with the plot, I mean, over the past year or so, I have really come to like solidify for myself that I do really enjoy gothic literature, gothic fiction in various different genres, especially like historical gothic, you know, gothic horror, gothic historical, gothic mystery, gothic fantasy. And it's high on the melodrama and I just eat it up. I love it in that specific subgenre. I don't know why. The plot was pretty straightforward in this one. I wouldn't say that I felt like there were like high levels of intrigue necessarily. There was a little bit of a mystery going on and for a little bit as the reader, you were like not aware. We weren't in on it. We weren't sure what was going on. Oh my God. Now I feel like I have an <coughs> eyelash in my eye. Oh fuck. I am just falling apart. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm starting to sniffle again. Sorry if I keep blinking like crazy or I look like I'm crying. There's just, I think there's something in my eye and it keeps watering. It's fine. But yeah, so even though, once again, the plot of a Gibson book isn't like, oh my God, it's my favorite plot ever. Um, I did enjoy it because the eerie, very gothic, atmospheric vibes were definitely there for me. And then the character dynamics were just so interesting and compelling to me. And there are, there are some sexy times in here. This is sapphic. This is sapphic romance, as you may have imagined with, you know, three characters that are all women, uh, two main characters. We get perspectives from Laura and then perspectives from Cam Carmilla. And yeah, I just really, really enjoyed the dynamics that we were saying. So I ended up giving this one 4.5 stars. It wasn't quite five just because it didn't leave me feeling like scream from the rooftops, all time fave, but definitely a fave, like a favorite of the year for sure. And then another one that I started in December and I finished 
in the very beginning, I think I finished it on the 1st or the 2nd um, of January, Warrior of the Wind by Suyi Davies Okungbawa. This is book two of the Nameless Republic series, adult fantasy set in an African-inspired world. And the first book is Son of the Storm, and the first book I gave five stars. Spoiler alert, I did not give this one anywhere near five stars. I was really bummed because it's been a couple of years waiting for this. And I do need to reread Son of the Storm because it's one of those books that over time, what I do remember of it, like looking back, I'm like, ah, if I reread it, I don't know if it would hold up as like quite as five star. Uh, that being said, this one was still quite disappointing <laughs> overall. It just really had pretty severe middle book syndrome for me. The plot just honestly did not grab my interest almost ever at all in any capacity. I am still going to continue with the series. I think it's just going to be a trilogy. I'm pretty sure. I'm definitely going to, if it's going to be more than three, I'm definitely going to at least pick up the next book and see if I would continue from there. So I'm still intrigued with the overall story being told in this world. Um, but basically the entire like 40 to 50% of this was this one like without being spoilery, it's like a prison break plot. And it just, it was, it was way too long. And it wasn't even particularly exciting, the actual prison break, I didn't think. Um, and it just felt a little convoluted. And then there was a lot of traveling. And I've, okay, most fantasy books, especially like epic fantasy, most of the time, there's some traveling involved. If there's multiple characters, if there's multiple perspectives, usually you have characters moving about in the world. I don't mind that. Like, no shit. Like, that has to happen. It's fine. And sometimes I can even really enjoy, like, a questy adventure time. Adventures of Amina al Sarafi. We're traveling about, going to and fro, here and there and everywhere. I really like that book. I love it. But this one, the ch it's when the traveling is just, like, too long and kind of dull and we're focusing way too much on the act of travel versus just we are traveling and now we're here like we're mostly just like here we are on the road the rusty dusty trail and I just I get so over it when it's repetitive and that was the case here the most interesting parts were toward the end there was definitely stuff towards the end that I was like oh shit like some reveals and further mystery and lore in the world and intriguing things going on, but it was only at the end and it did feel a little bit rushed as well. I definitely still have hope for the next book or books. Again, I think it's a trilogy. Um, and if it is a trilogy, you know, I really hope the next book sticks the landing and is like at least a 3.75 four star read for me um, because I did really enjoy the first one. But yeah, this one, Twas, twas not, twas not my fave. I ended up giving this 2.5 stars, which isn't like shitty. I don't think the book is like poorly written. It just felt very middle booky, you know? And it's been a while since I've read a sequel that just had extreme middle book syndrome. And I'm reminded of why we don't, we don't love that, you know? I do have a couple of other, I have a couple of NetGalley e-arcs and prior I did like a you know, arc review, upcoming releases review recently. There where I had like three or four. I only have two though, so I'm just gonna include them in this because I'm not gonna be reading another one for a hot second. So the next one that I completed in January is Neferura by Malena Evans. And this is historical adult and it is about Neferura. Neferura, why is that so hard for me to say? And I was intrigued with this one because I read The Woman Who Would Be King last year, and that is about Hatshepsut, who is Neferura's mother. Hatshepsut was uh, not the first female pharaoh, but the like most successful, and I think definitely the longest reigning of the couple of female pharaohs that they ever had. Um, and it was a pretty interesting book, uh, the nonfiction that I read about her and there's there's so much of it that is speculation because there's so little like written records of that time. They did use murals and statues and things like that to kind of convey certain things, but 
as I learned in that book, a lot of times they tweak it to like Hatshepsut was tweaking her statues and like images of her everywhere to look more masculine and look like a man and to kind of um, convey her connection to the gods and that she is a walking living god and all this stuff. So it's a lot of like the propaganda of it all. So even in that nonfiction, it's a lot of like, this could have meant this or that. Maybe she felt like this. Maybe she felt like that. We don't really know. And Neferura is obviously historical fiction. Um, and I enjoyed it. Overall, this book had pretty solid pacing for me. Uh, it kept me turning the page pretty quickly, consistently throughout the book. And having read The Woman Who Would Be King, I did have a pretty solid understanding of the world. And I don't know how this book would read if you didn't like have any kind of under like the rituals and like the the whole concept of like the god's wife like the god's wife of Amun I I understood all of that and I don't know how it would be as a reader if I had no knowledge of any of that whatsoever it might have been a little bit confusing I don't know I I could not say it was just a thought I had of reading it of like oh I'm familiar with all of this stuff and even like more familiar in in this book they don't go into like what the rituals really are and it's like jerking off a statue is one of them that they do every morning. That wasn't in Neferura, but like in The Woman Who Will Be King, they explain like these are the rituals. Um, so yeah, I have a, I had a pretty solid understanding. I'm not like a fucking expert on Hatshepsut by any means, but more of an understanding if, than if you had never read something like that. Um, and just how Hatshepsut came into power and everything as well. I really enjoyed the depictions of friendship in Neferura. Um, and the plot was pretty exciting too. There, it, like I said, it was a page turner. Like we were moving and grooving, plotting, what are we gonna do next? Scheming, etc. I didn't rate it higher than I did, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, just because some of the plot points did seem a little out of place. And then the ending felt a little bit too neatly tied with a bow. I just wasn't a huge fan of some elements of the ending, I guess. For the characters, Neferura in this was a little bit too like naive and oblivious a few times. And it just, it, it bothered me because it felt like it would be out of character. She talks about having been raised in, in court, you know, at court and being around all these people and the politics of it all and how good she is at all of that and how on top of it she is. Like she's so familiar with all of that. But then several times makes grievous errors uh, due to apparently sudden naivete when it comes to these things where I was like if you had this know-how You should have seen this shit coming stuff that I'm like I don't think if you were this knowledgeable in these things I don't think you would do this, you know, but again the friendships the depictions of friendship um, She had some like priestesses that she and I did also feel like uh, to Mosa he came off a little bit too like mustache twirly I ended up giving this 3.5 stars though a very solid read. If you at all enjoy historical fiction, if you're at all interested in Egyptian history, I would say give it a go, give it a shot. I think it, I said it was adult and I'm pretty sure it is marketed as adult, but I don't know how old the characters actually were. They did feel, it, it, they did feel a little younger, I suppose. So it might be categorized as young adult, not totally sure. It doesn't have to be just because the characters are young, but it also just felt there wasn't anything like crazy adult in the plot or anything like, you know what I'm saying? Well, content warning, actually, now that I say that I'm remembering, uh, content warning for like marital, you know, R word, I guess. Like it, it's one of the, like, it's doing, doing your duty, like having to get married, obligated to get married because you're royalty and that's what you must do. And then the sex scene it wasn't like on page or anything like that but you know and there's like a mention of it having happened and again it wasn't like a forcing upon but it was like a I can't really consent to this so here we go I guess uh so I, I will say that and then there also was infertility discussion with one character um also I would say too minor fat phobia I think like just in the beginning, really, I don't recall when it like fizzled out, but it, it did fizzle out eventually. But in the beginning, Neferura about herself. And I was wondering if maybe that's why it fizzled out, because she was as she was like gaining more agency and like confidence, 
is kind of when it fizzled out. So maybe she just that it was part of that. But in the beginning, she wasn't quite as confident and didn't have as much agency and like purpose. And she referred to herself kind of negatively, her body talking about like her gut sticking out and like her fat rolls and this and that, like several times where I noticed it being like, oh, keep talking about your gut. Like, oh my God. But again, it fizzled out and I'm, I'm thinking it was probably something like that. Like as she grows and feels more sure of herself, like she stops thinking negatively of herself, which is fine. That's good. Right. And then there's like grief, there's death of characters, um, and technically incest because again, Tutmosa and Neferura are half siblings and they, that's the marriage that has to happen. Um, and I don't believe that's a spoiler cause that's like a historical thing. <laughs> Um, and then, like I said, there's like the marital R word and like physical abuse, not aggressively and not like multiple times. Um, uh, but there is one time where you see Neferura getting struck, um, which, you know, it's no good. So just a heads up on those things. I was over here like, it's just read it. It's really young. There's nothing dark. And then I was like, wait, <laughs> there was a few things actually to Sean. The next one was another NetGalley e-arc, uh, but this was the one DNF for January so far. It is only the 13th, so, you know, I've got time. But this one was The Jin Waits 100 Years by Shubnum Khan. And this one just pretty quickly, I was realizing, was not going to be the writing style for me. I stopped at 15%, but I'm not kidding in the first, like, page or two, I messaged L and I was like, Hey, I just started the gin wings a hundred years. I don't know if I'm going to like it. I might DNF. Something about it just feels too disjointed for me, kind of nonsensical. And I, I don't know how to describe it because whenever I talk about books that have that like nonsensical metaphors, right? I don't mind that. I'll give you the sun rife with nonsensical, silly metaphors that I fucking love. But I think what it is, is that I enjoy that authorial voice when it is in a solid story that I'm following. Like a, a solid, I can follow this plot real easy. I know what's going on. And then you've peppered in all these like fun, nonsensical, like very creative, imaginative metaphors and adjectives for things. And like, I love that kind of authorial voice. Love it. But when it's more like like Black Leopard, Red Wolf, that kind of writing style that's also like kind of nonsensical, but in a plot that I find nonsensical, in a plot that I'm like, it, like as I described Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and to be fair, The Jin Waits 100 Years wasn't like as egregious, I don't think, it, for me personally in this regard. But what I said with that one is like, it's, it's like I feel like someone is telling me a story while they are like tripping balls on acid or something where I'm like, what are you talking about? I, okay, man, like whatever. And Black Leopard Red Wolf was like fully that. How I made it through 50%, I don't know. Again, not a bad book, just so not the writing style for me. And this one wasn't quite as like intense as that, but it had that same flavor, had that same vibe. So I was just kind of like, ah. Again, I think a lot of people will really enjoy this, like, a lot. It was just, it was a nope for me. Okay, I think I am actually going to stop it here because I've been talking for a long ass time and I have uh, four other books to talk about and I don't want to make this a 12 year long video. So that's going to be all for today. <laughs> Ending on a negative note with a DNF, but it's fine. Of course, like, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined and you haven't already. And if you want to just, you know, help the algorithm and make your presence known, let me know you're watching. Just leave a little emoji. Say hey. As always, thank you so much for your time. Hope you all have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.